Welcome to The Mischief. I'm Balin, and this is Vintage Story. A bit by bit, I'm going to be explaining to you how you can first set up your world. This may seem a bit dry, but don't worry, I'll have plenty of images and examples explaining what it is that this wonderful game can bring to you. First and foremost, this is a story sandbox game. It's very block-like, similar to Minecraft if you have not played it before, and is inspired from some modded Minecraft versions. We're going to start off by going over here to the single player button, clicking, and creating a new world. With this option, it gives you several general choices to make, but each of which can be customized just by clicking the button below. You can also name your specific save game file here if you want, or just randomize it. By hovering over each of these different selections, you can see that each one will give you a totally different experience depending upon how you'd like to go at it. Create a building one is pretty self-explanatory. Homo sapiens removes almost all story elements from it, but it does give you a very hardcore survival experience. Wilderness survival more or less just gives you a really good challenge if you want to go for a survival mechanic with really hard settings on there. Exploration, if you're more interested in just kind of a lighter experience and you want to do a bit more building or walking around, this is probably going to be the one for you. But if you just want your standard experience, which most people do go for and customize themselves, then this is definitely the one to choose. And it's the one that I'm actually going to be discussing with you today. By choosing standard and then customize, we're going to go over all the different types of options in here, some of which are going to be really quick, others a little bit longer, but don't worry, I'll have a little bit of example for some of these so you can see what they look like. To start with, you of course have your play style, whether it be standard exploration and so on. That's just what we discussed a moment ago. You've got your world height. This can affect a lot of different things depending upon how fast or slow it is. Your world loads when you're walking around or just starting it up. This can also affect how high your different mountains are going to be, which is going to have quite a big effect on how fast you can traverse things. So keep this in mind. The default is 256, but you can always increase that if you'd like. Your world seed is so you can keep some consistency. Some small details may change, but the overall landscape should stay the same unless you change some of the world generation settings. Game mode, survival, or creative. This one here is pretty self-explanatory. Keep in mind that if you start in creative, you can always turn your option into survival. And if you start in survival, you can always give yourself a creative option as well. The starting climate. This one here kind of makes a big difference. If you are okay with starting out in kind of a, an average area, then your temperate setting will be good. This is pretty much going to be your standard area. You're going to have some cold winters. You're going to have some warm summers. Going up and down from that, if you go into hot, well, you're not likely to see any kind of winter, uh, at least not a very hard one, and most of your crops will end up likely wilting or having trouble depending upon your settings. Same thing with icy and cool going in the opposite directions, you will more likely see, yeah, you're, you're going to be in the frozen wilds. Or at least that's what it'll seem like most of the time. Your random respawn radius, this is simple enough. You can just choose how far you want to respawn. If you want to respawn in the exact same spot every time, choose zero. Your default is within 50 block radius. Otherwise, you can always make it more challenging and choose it up to 10,000 blocks. A grace timer. This is actually really important. If you're new to the game, I recommend you change this from no timer, monsters spawn right away, to maybe give yourself five or 10 days. That way you have something to, well, one, to look forward to in kind of a, a, a terrifying way, but also it gives you the option of just kind of learning and getting your bearings in this new world and new game. Death punishment. This one here is rather important, whether you drop your inventory contents just straight on the ground where you died, or if you keep all of them and you just respawn with everything. Scrolling down, we've got our survival challenges. Seasons. Yes, this game has seasons that will change the color and effects of a lot of different trees, crops, and other things. You can have it so that things are always spring, summer, fall, or winter, or you can just have it so that all of them will cycle through normally. 
Keep in mind that you're in a slightly northern hemisphere setting, so if you do go south while you're traveling, you will get into warmer climates. Going north will get you into colder climates. Player lives. They're infinite to start with, which means if you die, you can just click the respawn button. But if you want to set yourself an additional challenge, you can always choose 1 through 20. Your lung capacity. Yes, you have a breath meter. Breathing underwater is not an option. This can make exploring in the water or hiding from creatures in water a lot more difficult. Your standard setting is now 40 seconds, which seems pretty appropriate to someone who can uh, hold their breath pretty well, but you can always change it to what you desire. 2 minutes, 60 minutes, yeah. Days per month. This is pretty much based on a real 12-month calendar. In 9 days, it would be your standard month would rotate. You can actually change it so that it's appropriate, and they even have life hours, like IRL hours in here, so you know about how much gameplay you're going to get for a season to change. True Winters. This one's important, and I should mention that just about any of these settings you can hover over, but it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily get a good idea of what it is, and that's what I'm doing here. It will damage crops, reduce animal spawns, and so on, as well as the meat harvested from animals that you might kill or find dead on the trail. This can make a big difference in your play because your crops can die. Doesn't mean that you'll lose them per se, but you won't really get much from them besides the seeds back again. Block gravity. This one here has another big impact on your gameplay. Sand and gravel is simple. Your sand and gravel can collapse, but if you look here we've got sand, gravel, and soil with sideways instability. This means that if you start trying to pillar up with something like dirt, sand, or gravel, it will start to collapse to the side unless you've got a big enough stack that will support it. Scrolling down, we've got allowing underground farming. Typically, farming does need exposure to the sky, or at least the air above, and it's pretty important for that. But there is also greenhousing. You can put some uh, glass above it and create an actual greenhouse environment in the end. But if you are a cave dweller type and you really want to be able to grow your stuff indoors, underground, without sunlight, that's the way that you can troglodyte. Your body temperature hardiness. Now this is rather important. This determines what temperature you start to freeze at. Your clothing and other options can help insulate you as well as warmth from things like fires. Creature hostility. Never hostile. Creatures will never fight back. Passive. Creatures only attack when provoked. And aggressive. Wolves, drifters, and locusts will attack you on sight. Other creatures attack when provoked. So you do have some that will just attack when you get close to them as well. Keep that in mind. But aggressive is the default and it's the most realistic setting. It does not mean everything is going to attack you. Just that the things that should or likely would will. Creature strength. 100%. That just means pretty much how much damage they're going to do to you. Your player health points. This is how much health you have before you perish. This can be affected in a positive or negative manner through all sorts of things. This can also be increased by eating different foods and having your nutrition numbers increased by a variety of different foods, helping to bolster and improve your hit points from what they currently are. Now, your hunger rate. This can be influenced by a lot of things, including holding things in your offhand, depending upon your class that you have, or different effects that you might be under. This can be adjusted in-game to a point, but usually not in your favor. Your walk speed. Normal is pretty good. Different classes of characters that you can choose can walk faster or slower, so this can also be influenced. But it can also be changed depending upon the gear that you're current, currently wearing as well. Your food spoilage rate. This has a lot to offer with how varied it can be changed. If you really want to extend it, I recommend instead sticking to 100% just because there are a lot of mechanics that are created in this game that will allow you to store food throughout things like winter or just over long term, depending upon how you design it. Going down to tree sapling growth time. The tree saplings grow a little bit slower. 
but that doesn't mean that they're going to produce any less. That's pretty much it. They just grow a little slower. They will grow into a sapling form before growing up entirely. Tool durability, this just means that your tools will break at a standard rate. If you desire, you can increase those percentages so that your tools can last longer. But often by doing that, you'll kind of spoil things for how the tool progression is designed, especially if you go into tool mining speed and you change that as well. When I first played this game, I cranked both of those up, and then I didn't really have much need for other tools later on because I didn't see the advantages of them. So this really does take a lot out of the game if you change these to a higher percentage. Pro pick node search radius. What's a pro pick? This is a prospecting pick. It's similar to a regular mining pick, but it will instead return results of what you find in the area. You will need to actually mine three different blocks that are within 16 blocks of each other, but at least three blocks apart from each other as well. Once you get this report, you can see what is most likely in the nearby area, as well as some potential absolutes depending upon the setting that you change it to. It has multiple settings. One of them determines what's in the six block radius. The other one determines what might be in the local area. If you do multiple searches in nearby lines or things like that, you can find out your most likely area to find a vein of a certain material that it's reporting. Then you can start digging down and hopefully find that item. Your global deposit spawn rate. This changes things for all the ores in the world. If you change this percentage, I recommend you do it in very small amounts because this has a huge effect on what you'll find. Microblock chiseling. Yes, there is a way to chisel entire blocks in here into smaller versions of themselves. By standard, it's set up with stone, wood, and bricks. I actually recommend that you change it to most cubic blocks. That way you can have a bit more effect on the different blocks that you'd like to chisel in this case, and not just the stone, wood, and bricks that you might otherwise. Your coordinate overlay. It's just some numbers at the top right that explain where you are in the world with X, Y, and Z coordinates. You can turn this on and off now or later on if you desire. World map, again, you have access to a world map. This can be accessed with the M key by default, and you can also see the uh, coordinates just by hovering your mouse over it. By pressing the space bar, it will center on where your location currently is. You can also place map markers and icons on here, and if you die, it will save your last death location so that you know where that was. By turning the world map off, you don't have access to any of this anymore. And if you do have the world map and you've been setting any of these waypoints and icons, it will display on your mini map if you have that turned on as well. Lore content. This is a really big tick box to untick. So I recommend you keep it ticked. This will remove almost all structures. It makes it just more a survival game and removes the story from vintage story. Getting more into that story part of it, we've got temporal stability. Temporal stability is more or less how much you are in sync with the world. And if that drops too low, then you can start taking damage, start seeing things you might not normally, and um, just kind of bad things happen in general. So make sure to keep your temporal stability up, which means you want this green glowy gear to stay full and not empty. Temporal storms are an event that happens every so often. You can change that setting for how often it happens, how much it increases, and the percentage that it caps at in this menu with the storms and the length as well as your stability options. These three all really tie into each other for that. Now during a temporal storm things look really crazy and depending on its intensity can look even crazier. So you're going to want to be aware that it's also a dangerous time to be anywhere in the world. You'll have mobs spawning nearby trying to attack you. They'll be difficult to see because of the vision and the different enhancements and crazy things going on around you. Besides the storms that happen every so often and for a few minutes, you'll undoubtedly find, over time, temporal rifts. 
These are very dangerous things that you don't want to stand in for more than a second or two, and they can be visible or invisible with this setting. I recommend making them visible. Then it would help explain why you're suddenly getting all these mobs spawning near you and attacking you. Temporal gear respawn uses. In other games, sleeping in a bed might be the way that you would set your spawn point. In this game, it's not true. You need a temporal gear. This can be used to set your respawn point just by holding right click and aiming at a location that you'd like to respawn. By default, this is set for 20 times. This might be important for you if you're new to the game. Sleeping during temporal storms, this is a way of getting out of these temporal storms. So <laughs> you can always turn that to disallowed or change it to allowed if you like, but uh, I recommend keeping it to disallowed or else every time that one of these comes up, you will be very strongly tempted to just sleep through it. Now let's cover world generation, your climate distribution, realistic versus patchy. So realistic means it's going to go cold, warm, cold, like the equator in the middle and the poles in the, t the north and south. But if you choose patchy, then your biomes could just be intermixed. Then we've got some newer options. This is land cover. How much percent of the world should be land while the rest is ocean? If you say 100%, that doesn't mean that there is going to be no water out there. The more land you have, the more likely you are to find ores and uh, different kinds of areas that are of interest. But also, the more water you have, the much safer travel you're going to be getting from one area to another. Now, the land cover scale determines how much ocean will be between the pieces of land. Now, upheaval rate, this is set at 40%. This is not the, your small stones and small hills and things like that. This is going to be very large sloping round mountains or rolling hills that you might see in the world. The higher percentage this is, the bigger and wider and more expansive those are going to be. Geologic activity. This is pretty much going to be hot springs. And no, you're not going to be um, getting healed by standing in one of these. World width. Simple enough. Same thing as world length. This is just a flat space and they are limited to a million blocks. You can change these to several million or just a few thousand. The world edge. You can make it so you can fall down or you can make it so that it's blocked and you and others cannot fall off of it with invisible walls keeping you contained. The polar equator distance. This one here, it's how far in blocks must a player walk to reach the equator starting from a polar region. So if you're starting from the north edge, you'll have to walk 100,000 blocks to get to the equator. This is your standard setup. Global temperature. This can change the worldwide temperature for everything. You can make it a little bit hot, a little bit cold. So even if you start in a temperate area, you can have it so that the uh, some temperatures can still be warmer in that temperate area. But as it says here, low or high temperatures might be difficult or impossible to survive or progress because sometimes a lot of things will die, including the player, if there's too extreme of a temperature or if the vegetation cannot survive. Global precipitation. Same thing with the global temperature. It just increases or decreases the amount of humidity uh, or aridity that there may be. So you're going to have a lot more rainfall, no rainfall, different kinds of crops will thrive or die, etc. Forestation and shrubs. Now this is kind of important. I recommend keeping it unnormal. Uh, or if you really want, you could reduce it slightly so that you don't have to fight with rabbits and wolves all the time trying to either eat you or your crops. Not necessarily in that order. But normal should keep your forestation and shrubs appropriate to the biomes that they're set up for. Your surface copper deposit frequency. Keeping it at rare is important, but if you start increasing the amount of land cover that you have or something like that to different values, then you might want to adjust this. So if you're going to have less land cover and more water, you're probably going to want to increase your copper deposit frequency. Same thing with the tin deposit frequency. If you're decreasing the amount of land in the area, you're going to want to set this up a little higher. If you're increasing it, you might even want to set it lower. Same thing with the copper. So these... I don't recommend you change them more than one setting different from what they currently are, but you should probably keep them where they're at because they're really well balanced at that level. And if you're curious about what this means, copper is usually your starting metal, while tin is usually another metal that you can alloy with copper to get your second level tier 
alloys. Now, snow melt and accumulation, this means that snow will actually melt during warmer temperatures and it will start accumulating during cold ones when there is some kind of precipitation. Going down to multiplayer, this one's really quick and easy. Land claiming, not an easy function to understand. I hope to cover that in a future episode, but you can claim an area so that it is yours and others cannot influence it in a negative manner. Class exclusive recipes. When you first start the game, you get to choose a class to play as. This, if you're playing single player, you might want to actually uncheck mark this so that you can have access to all of the class recipes and try them out for yourself. If you want the true experience though, then you'll want to keep that check marked on so that you can understand that something like a hunter will have access to a very early game bow, and something like the Malefactor class will have access to a sling, which is more mm, early to mid game. And then you've got something like a Blackguard, which is going to have access to a late game sword and shield that they can make, as well as other classes and different exclusive items. And then of course there's an auction house. This allows you and others on your server to trade their goods through the traders that you may find throughout the world. It's really nice and convenient option. There is a little bit of interest that is charged for using their facilities instead of actually going and visiting somebody's place. It can be really helpful, especially if you're long distance and somebody has some stuff that you want to buy. And with that done, just click apply when you're ready. It will change the settings for that and you can see all of your settings on this little overhead display when you hover over that option and just choose create world. And with that, I'll go into the next bit by bit. Thank you very much for spending your time here with me. I hope to see you again in the next vintage story.